So now we're going to talk about sampling distributions and something called the central limit theorem. So first off, statistical inference is to make accurate decisions about parameters from statistics. Remember, parameters are numbers that we calculate from the population. They're usually not known. We usually want to find out what they are. And statistics are the numbers we calculate from the sample. And we use those statistics to actually figure out what those parameters actually are. So if you want to find the mean income of the United States, or you want to find the proportion of people who um, want to legalize something, or you want to find the, um, the variability in a um, um, making a, a certain item in a, in a time to make a certain item. So you might want to find all this stuff out. You would use a sample, get your statistic, and then you'd estimate what the parameter is from that. And the whole idea of statistical inference is to do that in an accurate way. And that's what we're going to talk about. In order to do that, we need something called a sampling distribution. A sampling distribution is how is that statistics, that statistic distributed after repeated trials of size and are taking. And that's like, what is that? So what I want to do is show you what that means. So we're going to go ahead and get into this website. There we go. Okay. So we're going to go into this website and in this website, it's going to show us how to kind of look at what that means. And so sampling is um, a data collection process in which set of individual cases is selected from a larger group of potential cases. This is usually done as a matter of practicality. It's difficult, expensive, and often impossible to deal with a large number of cases. And so we work with a small number. And we draw them from a larger pool. So we have this large pool and we're gonna take a little tiny sample. So think of it as you've got this giant lake, let's say, and you're gonna dip a tiny bit into that lake to find out what's the pH of the lake or whatever. So we've got this large pool we're going to pull from, and we're going to take this little tiny sample here. Um, when we calculate a descriptive quantity from that sample, we understand that the results may be somewhat different when the process repeated it from with a new sample. So in other words, if I collect, if I take water out of a pond and I measure how much um, uh, pH is in that, then I do that again and again and again, I have the my one sample that has all those values and I can find that mean from all those values. If I went and did it again, I certainly won't get the same water every single time. So I would get a different sample and get a different statistic. How big is somewhat? So the question becomes important of how do you compare the descriptive quantity between groups or compare it to a hypothetical value? But for now, let's address just taking several samples, calculate the descriptive quantities, and observe the variation in that quantity from case to case. All right, so the way of addressing the question is particularly feasible with the set of param, uh, potential cases contained in the data table that a computer can easily carry out the work. So we're going to let computers do this for us. So here we're going to actually have uh, consider a population consisting of the entire set of runners in a road race data from 8,636 runners in the 2005 um, Cherry Blossom 10 miler. Um, this is available at some website. So you can get this information. It's actually in Mosaic data in um, an R package if you want to use that. And let's kind of visualize the distribution of the net race times in seconds and calculate the mean net race time for all the 8,636 runners. We're gonna go ahead and find that mean. So here's what that entire population values. This is for all 8,636 racers, their net, net race times. In other words, it's not their actual race time that they finish the race, it's how long did it take them to finish the race is the net time. And here's the mean, median actually, we're doing median in this case. Um, I'm also just for the fun of it, just to kind of show you what it could be, I'm gonna do SD also. So I'm going to run that. And there, even though it's still called med, because I didn't change that, um, it now is um, the standard deviation. So let's kind of remember this. The standard deviation is 969, 970, let's say. Going back, we start over this, and we'll do the median this time again. And the median is 555. Okay, so just kind of remember those values. 
Um, we don't actually need to do um, this is the exact answer. So this is exactly what the net time is. It's not going to change because this is the entire population. Um, so we will only need to take a sample. I'm doing the sample from this data only to help you see what's going on. Technically, we don't need a sample. We don't need any of the techniques we're doing in this course because we actually have the median of the entire population. But we're going to go ahead and do it just to show you how it works. We're going to take a sample. This is a sample of size 100. And so this is 100 values, 100 racers, basically. Each row is a unit of observation. And each row, in this case, is one of the racers. And this is what year, what their race number was, I believe it is, what state they're from, what their time was, what their net time was, because the, they don't all start at the exact same time. It's just how long it actually took them to run the race, their age, and what their sex was. There are lots of these, so we can keep going over and looking at the rest of these. But I want you to look at this very carefully. What happens when I run it again? And run the code again. Whoops, didn't happen. Why didn't it work? Let's start over. We'll go back and do it again. Should happen where it just runs it again. So this is what I want. Okay, so here it is. I'm gonna run this code again. Notice I get a different sample. So the first time DC was where it was, now it's Virginia. If I do it again, I get a different sample every single time I run it. For some reason it's not giving me every single time a different sample, but that's what's supposed to happen. Um, we're now from this sample, we're gonna go ahead and find the mean, the median. So the median from that sample is 5442. Remember the median for the entire population was 5555. Five, five, five. So we're close. This median for the sample was fairly close. If I were to do another sample, I get a different median. So each sample I'm going to get is going to give me a different median. We're now going to basically do the same thing. We're going to do a sample of size 100, and we're going to calculate the median from that sample of size 100. I'm going to do that four times. So in other words, this is sample one. The first time I took a sample of size 100 and I got that median. Now I did another sample of, five one, of 100 and I got that median again and again. So we get these values here. These are only for four. We could do it for more trials if we wanted to, but I only want to do it for four right now. Um, we can go ahead and do it again and look at what the graph of that would look like. If I took a different sample, I get a different graph. Now notice this graph looks a little normal, a little bell-shaped. If I go back and look at the original sample, the original population, I'm sorry, the original population kind of also looks nice and bell-shaped. So it looks like we've got a nice bell shape going on here. If I take a different sample, I get a slightly different shape. This is a sampling distribution. That's all it is, is we took a bunch of different samples of size 100, we calculated the median, and then we plotted up the medians. And this is what the medians look like. I can run it again, and I get a slightly different graph. But all of them kind of are looking like that nice bell shape that we were hoping to get. I then also looked at the median of the medians. Notice it's 5,564, or 46, sorry. Can't read today. And remember, our median of our population was 5555. So we're really close now to the, what the median of was of the population. The median of the medians would also be about the same as the population median. Notice the standard deviation is a bit smaller. Remember, our standard deviation was about um, 9,000, and this is about uh, 100. So it's a little different from that. So notice we get less variability when we've taken these samples. And the reason we get less variability when we take these samples is that we've kind of averaged out that variability by taking the median every single time. We've gotten rid of those extreme values and gotten just these middle values. So you should have less variability in the medians. Remember, these are medians. These are where I took a, me a sample, calculated the median. Somebody else took a sample, calculated the median. We did that 200 times, and we got this graph. And this is all a sampling distribution is.
I want to talk about one more concept with this and then we'll go and talk a little bit more about this. Oh, I got to put in the sample size. So we're going to put in a sample size of let's say 25. And run what that looks like. And again, it kind of looks a little bit like a bell shaped, a little bit off because we got this little hump here. But we kind of look a little bell shaped. I'm going to change my sample size to let's say 100. And now I get much closer to being a nice bell shaped. I got a little bit of a hump here, but not a whole lot. Much better to that. If I change my sample to 600, let's say, I get even a more bell shaped. So what is happening is I'm changing my sample size. Remember, I'm taking a sample. This time I'm taking a sample of 600. So I have my 6,000 people and I'm taking 600 of them and calculating the median. Then we're doing that again. I'm taking 600 of them, calculating my median, doing that. I'm doing that 200 times and calculating the median every single time. And then this is the distribution of those medians. And this is my sample median again. Notice it's pretty close to the 5555 five, five, five that we had before. And here is my standard deviation. Notice it's not the same as the standard deviation of the population. And that's okay. All right. So this is what a sampling distribution is. This is the whole concept of one. And it basically is where we just take a sample, calculate a uh, some kind of statistic, take another sample, calculate another statistic, and do that over and over and over and over and over again. Take the same size sample every single time. So I take 100 values or 1,000 values or 30 values or whatever it is, and take the sample. And that's what a sampling distribution is. It's just what shape are those medians or means or whatever you have. Um, this is for the sample mean, but it actually is the same for the sample median in a way. Um, the sample, the mean of the sample mean, notice it was almost exactly the same as our population mean. So mu is our population mean. The symbol for the sample, the mean of the sample means is mu with a little x bar down here, because mu is the population mean and x bar is the symbol for the sample mean. So this symbol here is the mean of the sample mean. And notice it was really, really close to what the mean of the population really was. And that should happen. The standard deviation, if you notice, was a little bit different. The standard deviation of the sample mean, we didn't actually do mean, we could have, was, again, the symbol for that, sigma is the standard deviation of the population. X bar is the sample mean. So this symbol here is the standard deviation of the sample mean. Notice it was smaller than the population standard deviation. And in fact, it's the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, where n is your sample size. Okay. And then we can get to what we call the sample mean, uh, central limit theorem. Notice in these, um, all of our graphs look like a normal distribution. And that actually is what this thing says. It's suppose a random variable is from any distribution. It did not have to be a, a normal distribution originally. Ours was, notice, remember, the finishing times was about, or the net times was about a normal distribution. But it doesn't have to be. It could be any distribution whatsoever. And if you notice, as our sample size got bigger and bigger and bigger, we got more and more closer to being a normal distribution. And that's what that says, is if a sample size van is taken, the sample mean x bar, the next time we were doing median, but same idea, becomes more normally distributed as n increases. And so then the question is, how big does n have to be? So all this means is that if I take some, I have some value variable I'm measuring, and it's from any kind of distribution in the world. It can be a skewed distribution. It can be anything I want. The bigger and bigger and bigger that sample that I take, I'm going to take samples and I'm going to calculate the median, or in this case, the mean. I'm going to keep doing that over and over and over again. I'm going to get my sampling distribution. As that sample size gets bigger and bigger and bigger, my sample mean becomes closer and closer and closer to looking like a normal distribution. Question is, how big does n have to be? Well, it depends on how things are originally done. So if I happen to have a normal distribution for my variables, so like height is a normally distributed random variable. Um, you've seen other variables that are normally distributed that you looked at. Time can be sometimes, sometimes not. Weight can be sometimes, but weight is kind of dependent on how much McDonald's we eat. So not exactly normally distributed, but it's close. But if you happen to have a random variable that is normally distributed, then, um, if n is 
it's got to be more than one. So it's got to be two or more. If it's two or more, then your X bar is also normally distributed. And all that means is I can draw this curve. That means I can draw a normal distribution, which is good because we know how to find probabilities for normal distributions. I don't know how to find a probability for this skewed distribution here. I don't need to know how to, definitely don't know how to find a distribution uh, probabilities for this distribution because it's wacky. But I don't care about the original random variable. I'm caring about what the sample mean looks like. What we're going to get into is more about the sample mean. And what this says is if n is bigger than or equal to 30, and 30 is just some number that we end up using. Um, there's nothing, there's no great reason why it's 30. We've just found that 30 is what works. It doesn't always work, but in a lot of cases it does. And then so the general rule we use is if we're bigger than 30, then X bar will be a normal distribution, which means we, again, we can find probabilities. Um, we can also look at my z-score. Remember, z-score is a measure of how far away from the mean, how many standard deviations away from the mean your value is. The z-score is calculated by x minus mu over sigma. If we put x bar in its place, minus mu of x bar over sigma of x bar, then that would just be what it'd be because you got the mean of x bar, I'm sorry, the x bar, x, x bar minus the mean, so this would be the mean of x bar over the standard deviation, so it'd be the standard deviation of x bar. But we just said that the mean of the sample mean is the same as the original population mean. The standard deviation of the sample mean is the standard deviation over the square root of n. So we can also use this formula for z, a little bit easier to work with. So let's do a couple of examples. Um, this is problem two from understanding um, statistics using Technology by um, Catherine Kozak. And this is a problem from there, from section 6.3. And what this says is a random variable is normally distributed. It has a mean of 245 and a standard deviation of 21. If you take a sample of size 10, can you say what the shape of the sampling distribution for the sample mean is and why? Well, I can because of what I just said. What I just talked about is, is if you happen to have a random variable that is normally distributed, then you can in fact say n is greater and can be any size. You can say your sample mean is, pop, is normally distributed. So because we happen to have that um, the sample size is, doesn't matter about being 10 because we had this thing right here that your random variable is normally distributed, we can say that x bar is normally distributed. And the reason why is because of this, because the random variable is normally distributed. So for a sample of size 10, state the sample mean and the, the mean of the sample mean and standard deviations. We want the mean of X bar. Well, that's just the mean of your original data. The mean of the original data is right here, it's 245. We also want the standard deviation of the sample mean. That's your standard deviation over the square root of N your standard deviation was 21, n is 10. It says right there, sample size is 10. So it's just square root, of, it's just 21 over the square root of 10. I don't care what that is. I don't need to know what that value is. I just need to know how to find it. So now I wanna find the probability the sample mean is more than 241. So we're looking for the probability that the sample mean, which is the symbol for sample mean is X bar, is more than 241. So again, I like to draw pictures. I can draw this normal curve because my, sam my original random variable is normal. We already said that. The center of this we know to be 245 and 241 is right here. So we can just shade everything up here and we got all that we wanna find. We're going to use R for this. So I'm going to go into R Studio and calculate this. I can do this in an RMD file if I happen to have one open, or I can just do it in the console. Remember, um, P norm, perhaps if I can spell P norm, P norm is how we find the probabilities of a normal distribution. P norm stands for probabilities of normals. Um, R value we were working with was 241. So 
So we do 241. Then we have to put our mean. So we're going to go back and look at what our mean was. Our mean was 245. And then I need to put my standard deviation. This is this 241 is an X bar value. The 245 is the mean of the X bar values. So I need the standard deviation of the X bar values. I didn't calculate it, but I know it's just 21 over the square root of 10. I can actually type that directly into, into R that way. So it's 21 divided by, that's just a slash, the square root, square root is SQRT of 10. And then the last thing is, is that I need to know if my lower tail is true or false. And I shade it above. So my lower tail is false. I'm not doing the lower tail. My lower tail is not shaded. It's the other shade. This tail is shaded. So my lower tail is false. And there's my probability. And I can just copy this and put this into my notes. All right, so we know that there's a 73% chance that we have a sample mean more than 241. That's part C, let's do part D. Same thing, but now we're gonna do a sample size of 35. What can we say about the distribution of, of the sample mean? Well, again, just as before, it's normally distributed since X is normally distributed. So I don't need to go through anything. I don't need to look at the sample size even because I knew my X was normally distributed. So it doesn't matter what the sample size is. My sample mean, and I'll write this. I can't really type that. My mean of X bar is the same as my mean. It doesn't matter what the sample size is. So it's still 245. My standard deviation of the sample mean is 21 over the square root of 35, because my sample size is now 35. Again, I don't need to calculate that. I just need to know how to calculate it. And now I want to know what is for a sample size of 35, what's the probability? So now we want to do the exact same probability. So the shading is going to be the exact same. But in here, instead of being the square root of 10, it's going to change to be the square root of 35. So go back to R. We'll change that to 35, find out what that is, and notice the percent is higher. All right. So the last question I ask on this is why is it higher? Why is this one higher? And that's because, because we have um, a smaller standard deviation because we're dividing by the square root of 35. Remember, it's smaller, the smaller standard deviation means we're going to be more peaked. So I could have actually redrawn this graph. And I will go ahead and redraw it just so you can see why this one would be this way. Here's x bar. But now, instead of being the graph I have, I'm going to be way more peaked. So I'm going to have way more, here's 245, here's 241, and notice I'm going to have a lot more of the curve shaded. So that's why it's higher, is because we have a smaller standard deviation when we increase the sample size. I'm not going to do another problem completely, but I just want to talk about why is um, the sampling distribution of this one. So we have a dishwasher has a mean life of 12 years, um, we'd like an estimated standard deviation of 1.25 years. Um, the life of a dishwasher is normally distributed. Suppose you can man you have a manufacturer who takes a sample of 10 dishwashers. What can you say? So again, since the life of the dishwashers is normally distributed, the sample size doesn't matter. So I can say that we're normally distributed. The last thing I just want to mention in this problem, again, these calculations would be done the exact same way using R, just changing your mean and your standard deviation. Make sure your standard deviation is divided by the square root of 10 in this case, because your sample size was 10. And the last question says, if you found a sample mean of life of 10 dishwashers be less than six years, would you think there's a problem with the manufacturing? 
Well, it turns out this probability is really, 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 really small. So in other words, not too many of the dishwashers should only last less than 10 years, less than six years. So if I found a sample mean less than six years, then I might think that there's a problem. Because remember the sample means the center, it's what you expect. So we'd expect a lot of these dishwashers to die within before six years, but that shouldn't happen. So that would make me think there's something wrong with the uh, manufacturing process. And that's sampling distribution.